Welcome to another session of ASM Live. We're here in New Orleans at the American Society for Microbiology meeting of 2011. I'm Jeffrey Fox, your host. I, I'm the features editor of Microbe, the monthly magazine of ASM. My guest for this session is Michael Doyle of the University of Georgia, and we'll be talking about food safety issues. Uh, before we start talking, uh, about those issues, I wanted to remind uh, those of you who are viewing us on the web that you can ask questions at hashtag ASM2011. And those of you who are in the room with us, you're, you're welcome to ask questions. Please raise your hand. Someone will provide a microphone and then we ask that you identify yourself by name and institution. Um, okay, so with all those introductions done, uh, Mike, I'd like you to uh, begin by giving us an idea of the, uh, you're, you're running a symposium this afternoon on food safety, and if you would give us some idea of the breadth of topics you're going to cover and what you think are some of the key points that people will be talking about. Sure. Well, thanks, Jeff. The, the idea of this symposium is to focus more on the global issues of food safety, and in part, uh, because the U.S. in particular is becoming more and more of an import, food import uh, uh, economy, uh, we're seeing with that lots of opportunities for uh, glitches in food safety. Uh, just to give you an example of, of, of what's happening here in the U.S., uh, back in 2006, about 15 percent of our food supply was imported. Today it's approaching 20 percent. And, and certain types of commodities, like fruit, more than 50 percent of our fruit is now imported, and 20 percent of our vegetables, and 80 percent of our seafood, and almost 50 percent of the nuts. And in and, and, and very specific areas, uh, for example, uh, 50 percent of our, our garlic comes from China, and, and more than 60 percent of apple juice comes from China. So you can see there are, are lots of opportunities for for food coming into this country to uh, have glitches, if you will, in, in food safety. Other areas of interest uh, uh, is the chemophobia that, that's occurring in some parts of this world, in particular in the EU. Um, I was at a symposium last year, and, and the speaker after me, was, uh, one of the first things he said was, you know, we're, 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 we're seeing uh, uh, the removal of benzoates from foods here. Largely, be, largely because it's not based on science, it's because co consumers are concerned about benzoates in their food. And so pressures were being put on the food industry to remove benzoates. Well, benzoates have a, a bigger, uh, they, they perform a larger function in, in, in foods than just preservation. It's not just to prevent molds and yeast from growing, but it can help prevent uh, staph food poisoning outbreaks. It can help prevent uh, salmonella problems. And the concern I have is next on the list in Europe is sorbates. And they also have similar functions. And, and we have to think about the food safety ramifications when we, we make these changes. Other areas, uh, we talk about antimicrobial resistance concerns here in the U.S. And, and they are, they are uh, an issue we need to address. But in many countries, and, and it's well known in China, uh, antibiotics are frequently used in fish farming and, and food production. And the types of microbes that are coming from these, these multi, multiply drug resistant microbes coming from the food that's being produced, whether it be poultry or, or uh, uh, fish farming, uh, it, it's, uh, it's quite incredible. And so uh, as we become more of a global economy, we're going to see, I think, a lot more food safety issues that we're not prepared to address. Okay, so, and uh, in terms of the, uh, does that give, give us a good idea of the, of the people who are speaking in, in the symposium? Are, we, are they covering these subjects, or is, are there any others that we ought to take note of before we, we move on to other questions? Well, one other issue I can think of is trade barriers that uh, are evolving as a result of, uh, of globalization of our food supply. And, and one example is in the EU, 
Uh, there's a law that now says we can't have salmonella raw chicken. Well, that's, that's uh, almost impossible to do. And so uh, we had a, a group of scientists, international experts in, in salmonella and poultry uh, come together over a two-year period and ultimately published a re report on this, on, on the findings of this group. And basically, they came with the conclusion that it's basically impossible to have salmonella-free poultry, and we have to do what we can to reduce the levels of salmonella in poultry, but to, to, to uh, have a... Uh, a, a rule or a law that says you can't have salmonella in, in raw poultry is more of a trade barrier, it, it's felt, than it is a, a true scientifically based rule. Oh, so that's something that they were thinking of or imposing on imports into their country? No, well, that, they're thinking their in market. their own countries as well as foods that would be external. So. And how do you enforce that? Do you arrest the chickens? I, I don't know. Well, I suppose you, you ban the shipments coming in or, or uh, you'd have to uh, uh, work with the producers and processors within their own inter uh, EU community. That seems like a very tough order, but uh, as long as we're talking a bit about law, I thought it might be interesting to uh, think back to the fact that the, uh, the U.S. Uh, has now a new Food Safety Modernization Act that uh, went into effect in January, or at least it was signed in January, and um, in terms of it's going into effect, I thought we, uh, we might explore that a bit because I understand there are some difficulties in implementing the law, uh, at least in terms of funding, and what, what implications it might have for ordinary people in terms of improving food safety, not only for domestically uh, grown and produced foods, but also for imported foods in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think, uh, you know, it, when you talk about the, uh, the cost of implementing this, it, it will be significant, but a large part of that cost is inspectors, to, to bring more inspectors into the FDA program, and uh, that would probably be the, the part that would not be uh, fully implemented or addressed if the funding weren't provided at the level of it needs to be to implement the law. But there are a lot of new uh, twists, if you will, to the uh, food safety regulations that will come into play. Um, everything from the FDA's uh, has been man mandated to develop uh, uh, produce rules. Uh, in the past, they've been, uh, I guess, uh, voluntary for the industry to, f to follow good agricultural practices. And, and now these rules, or these, uh, these, these uh, good agricultural practices will be, be mandated. Uh, there's the opportunity now for FDA to mandate recalls if they feel that uh, the, the, the need exists. In the past, it's been voluntary for companies to, to, to do this. Um, there's going to be a big emphasis on prevention, but the reality as I read it is the prevention is going to be largely uh, the onus of the producers and processors of the food. And so uh, even though there will be some cost to the government, it's probably going to cost the industry a whole lot more to implement that. All right. To, so for them to, to comply with the law, mm -hmm. they're, they're going to have to change their operations. And Well, let, let's, let's explore. I, I, I'm kind of curious, uh, and I, in other sessions here at ASM, there, there's a great deal of talk about new technologies uh, for for tracking diseases, and to some extent those new technologies should, should have a role to play in food safety. And I'm, and I'm wondering how, what's happening? What's, what are the hot spots? What, what gets your interest uh, and catches your interest and attention in terms of new ways to make sure the food, food is safe? Well, I think mm -hmm. one of the major advances from the public health arena has been the, uh, the PulseNet system that the, the uh, CDC and the state health departments have put together. It's incredible that, you know, within the last two to three years, they're detecting outbreaks that in the past would have gone unrecognized. Uh, we, we've come up with uh, at least 10 or 12 new types of foods that previously had not been recognized as, as vehicles and foodborne outbreaks. Who would have thought cookie dough could have been a problem? Uh, pizza, uh, uh, pepper. 
and this is one of the hot issues I think that we're going to hear a lot more about in food safety in the future, and that's spices. And, and FDA has already put its finger on that, but I think I, I did an analysis of the 2009-2010 uh, uh, FDA refusals of spices for Salmonella specifically, and there were over 1,400, uh, and most of those were in 2009. And, and pepper, you'd be amazed how much Salmonella you can find in black pepper and uh, white pepper and, and a variety of other spices. And so uh, I think that's another area within this global economy area that we're going to see more emphasis. And a major concern there is a couple. One is when you put spices on a food, it's often, it's often something that's already been heat treated and, and you're ready to eat that product. It's a, like a potato chip. We've had outbreak in the past with paprika going on potato chip, and I can see this coming with, with pepper. But uh, high risk populations also eat these kinds of foods, you know. And so that makes it even more challenging to, to, to ensure that they're safe. And, and there are ingredients that go into a lot of different products. And that's what happened in, in a few of these major recalls that we've had recently with black pepper. Uh, an outbreak occurred, and then we found that the pepper went into a lot of other products. So other products had to be recalled. Well, I'm, I'm happy we're in New Orleans where they use red pepper. <laughs> well, it well, was both red and black. I didn't touch on that. But <laughs> Is that right? OK. Well, it, if. Now, I, I, it's strange to me to hear you say that, that spices are, are uh, culprits because traditionally and historically, spices have been used to preserve foods and make them safer uh, to eat when they're held long term, even at room temperature. So what, what's going on? Is that some new trend or is this an oversight? That's, that's one part of the question. And another thing that occurs to me is that I thought to some extent, or to a large extent, that spices, the powdered spices, and that's, those kind of products were, were irradiated. And they, you know, somehow the public accepts that exception to their disdain for irradiation as a, as a food safety measure. Yeah, those are complicated both questions. E excellent points. Uh, regarding the irradiation, actually uh, some spices are irradiated, but there's different ways in which you can treat the harmful microbes, and, and they can <coughs> steam it. Uh, the, the, they steam spices. They, uh, companies will irradiate, uh, and they also can use ethylene oxide, and, and that's been shown to be a, a carcinogen, so that may be phased out in the near future. Propylene oxide is sometimes used as well. But the reality of it is some companies uh, may apply this at a very low level, but not at the level you need to kill salmonella because it affects the flavor characteristics. Uh, all right, so, and, and the, the first part of my question was about the, the irony or the paradox that spices mm -hmm. are supposed to, to preserve foods, yeah. and here they are carrying in the contaminating microbes. So what, what, what's up with that? Well, that's a good question, too, in, in that uh, if you look at the FDA refusal list, oregano is known to be a very strong antimicrobial agent, but there's all sorts of salmonella uh, found in oregano. And so... Is that uh, why the pizza's bad? No, that was another okay. issue. Another issue, all right. That was something different. But the, uh, the reality, and, and I've seen reports of... of uh, cilantro having antimicrobial properties, but we find salmonella in cilantro naturally. And so there, apparently there's just not enough of the antimicrobial activity present to control or be bactericidal, if you will, to kill uh, salmonella that might be present. Okay, so what, what would be some of the other, I'm, I'm assuming that these are, well, of course, spices are, are used widely and, and they can be just go to any household across the country and they're, they're going in small lots, but what, what, other, what other food sources should we be thinking about now? Are there any you know, highly topical issues that, that you're worrying about uh, these days or is it just it, once, once you find green peppers or black peppers or whatever, it, that it's just one more item to add to a growing list of of things that make your hair gray? Well, from the big picture perspective, uh, my biggest concern is that we're seeing a major shift 
in foods being uh, produced and processed outside this country. And, it, and it's growing at a, at a dramatic rate. It's, it's, it's only going to continue, in my view, uh, for several reasons. Uh, labor is a bigger, one of the biggest issues. Uh, there was a study done back in 2008 uh, by our USDA ERS and, and Texas A&M University, and they reported about 40% of the cost of processed foods goes to labor. The farmer gets back about 19%. And then there's, there's other you know, breakdowns into you know, transportation costs and so on, but labor is the biggest cost. And when, when food can be produced for, for 50, or processed for 50 to 75 cents an hour in China and some of the developing countries, and here in the U.S. we're paying over $10 an hour, it's not very competitive. And if you look at, at the grocery, go to the grocery store and take a look, especially in the processed fruits area, you'll see that many of those come from China, Philippines, Thailand, Mexico. But what do you mean processed fruits? Well, have you ever seen these little cups of fruit that, that uh, companies uh, sell? Uh, you just peel off the top and then you, you can eat it as a jello or, or, oh, or cut see. up fruits. So Look. you're not talking about fresh produce uh, so much as something that's... Minimally good. processed. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So or that, further processed. Yeah. Now, in the, in the matter of imports versus domestically produced foods, I would kind of wonder that the, the imported food, at least nominally, goes through an inspection process, whereas uh, domestically produced food isn't subject to the same border control uh, issue. So isn't that a choke point, a safety play, play, a, a point of safety where uh, if you had the right techniques and enough inspectors, you could improve the safety of imports. And in a way, you've suggested that if FDA is rejecting more and more lots, they, they seem to be paying attention to, to, that, to that problem, that potential problem of imports bringing in, being contaminated, being a problem. Well, well, think about this, Jeff. If there's a big ship coming in, full of uh, uh, cargoes full of uh, food, how much of that is the FDA going to be able to actually visually inspect and test? It's a very small percentage. In fact, it's usually in the area of about maybe half a percent is actually tested, and about one percent is is visually inspected. So, um, of these, I think they're up to twelve, more than twelve billion entries a year now. Million million entries a okay. year, uh, we, we're, we're, we're only uh, inspecting a very, very small amount of the food that comes into this country. And, and you don't see any technology that might help remedy that avalanche? Well, in the, in the, in the real near future, probably not. Uh, you just can't test this, this away. What we have to do is work with countries uh, in their prevention. Of, of contamination from occurring as we are in this country. We're putting more emphasis on this. It's called HACCP programs and... and uh, Do you want to share with us what HACCP yeah, stands for? HACCP stands for Hazard Analysis Critical Control Points and what that means is companies will evaluate their processes or, and, and determine if there are hazards where chemicals could get in or uh, uh, biological hazards like salmonella could get in. Or, or physical problems where there might be glass or something that could get into product. And then uh, they, they establish what are called critical control points. If, if salmonella can get in, well, for milk, we pasteurize. That's the critical control point to kill it. And, and, and so the concept is we, we uh, companies uh, develop preventive measures, and, and we can monitor the critical control points to ensure the safety. Um, and we can say that in, you know, in China, you got to do the same thing, but we, we don't have any way of enforcing that. So we have to work with governments to... Well, we can enforce it by not buying the products, right? If, well, that's one way to do it. makes people sick. But, you know, when, it, when, when food is, is much less expensive, people tend to migrate that way. I see. So there's a certain consumer roll of the dice. Now, the, now the government, as part of this, this, yeah. food, uh, this uh, food Safety Modernization Act, is, is going, I think, to put more emphasis on those companies that bring food into the, the U.S. And, and, and make them more responsible. But uh, still, it's going to be a real challenge to get. And, and this is one of the reasons that 
co uh, countries like China can produce foods cheaper if they don't have to have HACCP programs and, and if they can use certain types of antibiotics that we can't and pesticides that we can't, uh, they, can they can grow products uh, at a reduced cost. It's not just the labor that processes it, but th there's other factors that come involved in producing the food at less cost. All right, but, but to some extent we have to, we, the U.S. government or the consumers have to insist on, um, on those products meeting quality standards that, are, that they, they want, you know, that, that are important for their health and safety. Uh, even if they, it's hard to uh, enforce on a one-by-one -one basis, but if enough people get sick, they'll certainly Raise, raise their voices and complain. Well, that's typically, it's a reactive thing yep. in the U.S. When we have an outbreak, if we have salmonella and cantaloupe coming from another country, then we ban that for a while and work with the country and try to fix the problem. Well, it's good some, some fixes are in order. Well, I, I'm looking around. Do we have any questions from the Internet, from the audience? We, we do have a question. Just a minute until Jim gives the microphone over. Hi, I'm Tina Say with Science News Magazine. I was wondering if you could expand a little bit about the benzoids in the, in the food and whether or not removal of those things has led to an increase in um, food safety incidences. Well, but benzoates uh, have, have <coughs> typically been used to control mold and yeast spoilage. Uh, if you look at beverages, for example, you'll see benzoates. Uh, uh, have you ever had chocolates that have uh, soft fillings? Well, they'll typically have sorbates or benzoates. Uh, if you don't put that in there, they'll probably explode with time because the yeast will, will grow and produce gas. Um, but a lot of uh, uh, even microbiologists don't, don't appreciate that benzoates and, and sorbates, which are like they go hand in hand in terms of controlling mold and yeast in, in uh, processed foods. Uh, they also have antimicrobial activity against harmful microbes. And, and we, in the U.S., we become accustomed to, to pastries, as an example, that have dairy fillings, creams, and things like that. Uh, they'll frequently, more often than not, if they've got a long shelf life, have sorbates or benzoates in there not just to preserve, but this does have a, a, a positive effect on, on preventing Staph aureus from growing and producing toxin, which has been a problem with this type of pastry product in the past. That's just one example. Sorbates. That's, th this one really frightens me because there are many foods, uh, it processed cheese is an example, in which sorbates are added to control Clostridium botulinum. That's why you can have shelf-stable cheese. Uh, on, on the grocery shelf. And, and uh, we, we have to think this all through before we start eliminating these types of chemicals that have been in our foods for many years for specific reasons. All right, we have another question, please. I'm Stanley Malloy from San Diego State University. You brought up China several times, and I think it's really important to note that China itself is trying to improve food safety for citizens of China. And an important thing, it seemed to me, would be if, if we could work together with China to improve food safety overall from the U.S. as well as the perspective of the Chinese government. Are there interactions at that level that are ongoing, especially with respect to these new regulations? Yeah. Well, excellent point, Stan, and you're, at, you're right on track. I, uh, you know, I can't represent the FDA, but what I, from what I know is going on, yes, they are putting representatives over there, but considering the uh, the tens of thousands of food processing facilities that, that, are, that are located there. It's not possible at this point to, to cover everything, but at least we're, we're, uh, we're there, and we're, we're in India and in several other uh, countries, in developing countries that are, that are providing quite a bit of food to the United States. And so that, that's at least getting us engaged with this concept of, hey, developing uh, ways to prevent foodborne contamination in countries like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question. 
Hi, I'm Barbara Hyde with the ASM staff. We know that chickens carry salmonella naturally, but how is salmonella getting into spices? Is it from the food itself being contaminated before it's processed? Is it the processing process or is it the people involved? How is this happening? Well, that's a good question, Barbara, and it's probably all of the above, but I, I, I give you an example. I, too bad we don't have slides available. One slide can give you, you know, <laughs> make a hundred words, but, but uh, in India, for example, uh, black pepper is grown in like one or two acre parcels, and uh, it's picked by hand, and then it's laid out on the ground to sun dry, and there'll be people walking on this, raking it, uh, and then, and then they'll package it up into a burlac, burlac uh, sack and uh, bring it to the market where it's then sold. And big companies and small companies buy it that way. And then it's shipped over here in the U.S. in those sacks. And then there's no further processing here to clean it up? Or? Well, it depends on the company and the degree of processing that's applied. It's been assumed that every, you know, companies are irradiating, as you described, or or using a steam treatment or, or applying uh, ethylene oxide and it varies among companies how, how, how they apply it and if they apply it. All right. It affects flavor characteristics. Yeah, so the culprits for, for an incident like that might be as much in the U.S. for not taking proper care of the product they've imported as it is on the people who produced it in, you know, in the a developing country somewhere else. If, if you're assuming that there must be a, a treatment, which I think there should be as well, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, or just some kind of inspection at least to see whether it's carrying a pathogen. I mean, by the, by the uh, processor and purveyor in the U.S., you would think they would want to do that as a matter of course almost to protect their own reputation. Well, there's been many outbreaks where we've, we've found there's a problem, people get sick, you go back to the food and test it and you can't find it. Yeah, so testing or, isn't always the answer. Right. Or it, it, it helps, but it's not, yeah. not always the answer. Or it's an unexpected yeah. source, as you say. So we have another question from Thank, the room. <clears throat> Hi, thanks. Isaac Rowe with Goldman Sachs. Um, you mentioned the need for increased food inspectors to make a lot of this a reality on the testing side. Are you aware of any provisions in the Modernization Act that call for funding for increased uh, inspectors, and are you already starting to see more people out there doing the work? <laughs> well, I, I'll, I'll openly admit that I'm, I'm not on the uh, regulatory side, so I, I can't speak for the, the agency, but my, my understanding is that uh, uh, there's an appropriations committee in Congress that has to appropriate the money. The law is passed, but the money to uh, enforce this would have to be appropriated by a different group within the government, and uh, and that's where a hurdle is right now. Yeah, it's a very it's a hot political issue, and there is a difference between saying you can spend the money and providing the money for FDA to spend. So that that's part of what's going on. Um, do we, we have another question in the room. Yes, Suzanne Barth, University of Texas at Austin. And can you call or write various processors and ask what techniques they have for um, purifying spices or making sure that a chemical like uh, wheat gluten is really wheat gluten and not melamine and so that we don't have problems with um, foodstuffs? Is, do you think the companies would be forthright and let us know what they do? Yeah. Well, you know, I, my, my impression is that food companies here in the U.S., uh, they, they don't want melamine in their product at all, but what they do is there's different degrees of oversight in China, for example. And uh, some go through uh, intermediate <coughs> people who may not be as trustworthy as others. So companies don't necessarily know for sure what they're getting. Some companies have what they call boots on the ground. They actually have their own people there and they watch the process and they watch the ingredients and so on. And so it, it, I think it varies a lot among companies in terms of what their commitment is to food safety. So you can find it on their website or you can ask them, but it may not mean a whole lot in, unless you, you really know the, the company well. Another question, please. Hi, uh, I'm Ming Dong from Lawrence Berkeley Lab, California. 
Uh, my question is, um, if I assume if we emphasize on food safety side, the cost probably will go up, because the cost of the food will probably go up, like more inspector, ban some harmful chemicals. Um, but with this, um, the, when food price go higher, some consumer may not be able to afford it, especially in developing, developing country. How can we balance the two food safety and the cost of food? Well, that's an excellent question, and, and I don't have the answers, but uh, definitely here in the U.S., food, is, food prices will likely go up as more, uh, more regulations uh, come into play, and, and uh, consumers are just going to have to be prepared to, to pay, pay more for food here in the U.S. Now, now how that works in other countries, uh, I can't speak to that. I know in some countries what's done is they have a market for the U.S. and a market for internal, and they, and they don't have as many restrictions on the food that's sold internally. I'm not saying that's right. I'm just saying that's what happens. But, but we really do need, uh, as, as Stan indicated, to, to do our best to, to make food safe for everyone throughout the world. Any questions from the Internet? No. Well, uh, then let me thank... Thank you again, Michael Doyle from the University of Georgia, who's introduced us to the concept of exploding chocolate candies <laughs> and other maybe down-home food safety issues. Uh, this is the end of another uh, ASM Live session. There'll be several more later today. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>